Ernie, John, Kelly, Shannon, Cassie, Carol, Jada. <laughs> I think that's all of them. <clears throat> all right, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. Where does that come from? All right, you guys say the Wizard of Oz? Wrong! <laughs> of course you're wrong. <laughs> it comes from an opera from 1823 called Clary. And there's actually a song in the opera called Home Sweet Home. And uh, here are the words. Just one phrase. I'm not going to give you all the words. but Through pleasures and palaces, though we may roam, be it ever so humble, there is no place like home. So, I mean, we all know the opera Clary is not what made it famous. It's not why you know the slogan today. We all know it because of the 1939 um, movie, you know, Wizard of Oz. And it stars this little girl by the name of Dorothy. And because of this twister, you know, like a big tornado picks her up and throws her down um, right in the middle of this magical land of Oz where animals can talk. And there's these little people that sing and they're happy. And there's monkeys that fly, and there's witches, and there's a, a wizard, and the city is the bright color of emerald, and there's this yellow brick road that just sort of leads the way exactly where um, she needs to go. It's an amazing place, especially if you read the book. I mean, in the movie, it's pretty amazing, too, because, I mean, they had the whole thing where it was the first color movie ever. So you had the black and white at the beginning with the twister and then Kansas, because let's face it, Kansas is black and white, right? And then all of a sudden, they get to the land of Oz and the color turns on. Can you imagine for the first time seeing color TV when that flipped on? That would have been pretty amazing. Um, it was an amazing land. If you read the books, it's just so rich and it's so full. And it's like one of those places you're like, wow, I wish I could visit Oz. I know that there's some nasty characters there, but there's also some all sorts of great things. So you would think if Dorothy finds herself in this magical land of Oz, that she would enjoy it and that she would want to stay there and she would want to learn how to adopt to the people that are there. But that's not the case, is it? The entire time that she's in the land of Oz, she just wants to go home. She just wants to be with her family. In fact, the whole movie is really just a quest for her to find a way to get home. She's going to see the Wizard of Oz. Why? Because she believes that he has the secret to get her home. <laughs> And so you have that last scene or one of the last scenes where she's got the ruby slippers and she's clicking them together three times and she chants over and over and over again, there's no place like home, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. And boom, she's finally able to make it right where she wants to be, home. And this is true, isn't it? I mean, there is no place like home. I don't care whether you live in a palace, I don't care whether you live in a trailer. There's just something about being home. I don't care whether you're traveling to Europe or whether you're traveling uh, to Muncie. You know, there's just, there's no place like coming back home. I think it was six years ago, I'm not sure, but we went on this huge trip out east. We called it the East Coast Extravaganza. And we saw all sorts of cool stuff. We went to the city of Philadelphia and had Philly cheesesteaks and saw the Liberty Bell. You know, we went to Plymouth Rock. You know, we went to Boston. You know, we went to New York City and went up on top of one of the skyscrapers. We went to Acadia National Park and saw lighthouses and the ocean and hiked trails. We came back home through Niagara Falls and we saw the beauty of Niagara Falls. We did the same thing two years later, so we went the other way. We went out west and we went to Yellowstone and we went to see um, the mountain with the people's faces on it, Mount Rushmore. <laughs> I couldn't think of it for a second. We went to see the Grand Tetons and uh, the Badlands, all sorts of these wonderful places, once out east, once out west, and took all eight of us. Now, there's only one way that we can afford to take all eight of us on these huge trips, and that's camping. So we had this little pop-up, and you know, we would travel sometimes 10 to 12 hours a day in this pop-up, and we would get to a campground, and then we would you know, do all the hard work of popping everything up, and we had all of our stuff in a car top carrier, so... Caleb and I are scrambling on top of the roof and trying to get bags out and sleeping bags and set everything up. And then you've got to eat. So, you know, we would uh, pull vegetables out of the coolers and cut them up and make a fire and, and cook over the fire. And then if you wanted to take a shower, you had to use the cold water in a, in a shower house. 
Mount West, they actually make you pay. You have to pay $2 for a cold shower wherever the campground is you are. And so we can sum that up in one word, work. Okay, vacation's supposed to be vacation, right? But vacation ended up turning into work. Now, did we see cool things? Yes, we saw cool things. Did we have fun? Yes, we absolutely had lots of fun. Will we do it again? Should we do it again? <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, so let me start with the East Coast extravaganza. So we were coming back uh, through from Maine, and we were coming home, and we were supposed to stay in Niagara Falls for two nights. We were supposed to spend a night at a campground for two nights there. You know, we drove through some rain on the way to Niagara Falls, and so the pop-up was wet, and so there just seemed to be a general consensus of nobody wanted to pull the camper into a campsite, pop everything up, and get everything ready for the night. We'd just driven for like 10, 12 hours. We just wanted to go to sleep. I was like, fine, fine, we'll, we'll just get a hotel room. So we got two hotel rooms at a you know, crappy Motel 6 type of place and, and uh, got, got, you know, had some good night's sleep. Next day we got up and we're like going to spend the whole day at Niagara Falls and then go to the campground for the second night. That's going to be the plan. So we get to the Niagara Falls and the kids look up at it and say, oh, cool, a waterfall. Let's go home. <laughs> so <laughs> we went down and we went and rode the, the Maid of the Mist. I said, you at least got to ride the Maid of the Mist. I mean, it was a really kind of a chilly day. And uh, we saw the falls. But at the end, I'm like, well, we could do this and we could do that. And we could go on the river walk. And, you know, we could see where my ancestor, you know, crossed over the gorge on a tightrope. Just want to go home. It's so fine. So we all packed up the car and we just went home. So here they are. They're staring at one of the wonders of North America. I mean, Niagara Falls is this amazing place. And they're like, not impressed. And the reason they're not impressed is not because it's not impressive. It is impressive. The reason they're not impressed is because they just want to go home. You know, they've been doing this for two weeks. They've been out and about. Yeah, they've seen some cool stuff, but there's no place like home. And same thing when we came back from the East West Coast. You know, it was almost like, let's just go. Let's just... Let's Let's rush through these last couple days and just get home. And I remember turning around to him and I was saying, so we want to keep the pop-up and do this again sometime? And the universal answer was, no, sell the pop-up. We're done. <laughs> okay. There's no place like home. You know, last fall, I spent uh, three nights in Nashville. And Nashville's a very cool city. And you know, one night we went around downtown. It was a work thing. And uh, we were, it was cool to walk by all the establishments and hear the live music coming from all these different places. But even as I'm walking down the street in Nashville, I'm just thinking, I would rather be at home on my own couch right now with my own family rather than here. Because there's just, there's no place like home. And that's what the book of Joshua really is about, is the Israelites finally make their way home. You know, back in Genesis chapter 12, God came to Abraham and he made him three promises. He promised him that he was going to give him a piece of land. He promised them that he was going to give them a family to fill that land. And he promised them that while they were in that land, that they would be extremely blessed. Yet guess what? Abraham went and enacted those promises. He came to the land of Canaan, but there were people there. It would be like God saying, yeah, I, I got your house down there. Go live in it. And so you get there, and there's people in there. You're like, God, what are we supposed to do about these people? Oh, I'll take care of those people. When? Oh, when it's my time. Right? So Abraham lived his entire life in the land of Canaan and never owned a piece of it, not even the littlest foot of land, until his gravesite. That's it. That's the only piece of land that he owned. So Abraham received this great promise of a home. He didn't have a home where he was from. They were nomadic. Here he was going to have a land that they could call their own. Yet during his entire lifetime, he never saw the fulfillment of that promise. You know, he passed the promise on to his son Isaac. During Isaac's lifetime, he lived in the land of Canaan his entire life. He also never owned a foot of that land. When is this promise going to be fulfilled? So then we move on to descendant number three. Jacob is the recipient of the promise, Isaac's son. And he never owns a foot of that land. Because there's famine in the land, he actually has to take him and his sons and they move to Egypt because that's where they can get some food. They live there for decades. And they continue to grow. So one of the promises of Abraham is, is starting to be fulfilled, right? He's starting to get his family. Even though him and Sarah were old age and barren when they received the promise, here we are 100 years later, and all of a sudden, boom, hundreds and hundreds of descendants. And that's just going to continue to grow. So there came a time when a new pharaoh came in charge, 
And he didn't know who all these Israelites were. He just saw there's a people of another ethnicity, and there's just so many of them, they're going to overtake us. And so the Pharaoh got scared, and he enslaved them. And so the Israelites were slaves for 400 years. So here's the promise of a home. They were in the home. They're just sharing it with other people who had more of an ownership to it than they did. Then they moved to a different place. They were slaves for 400 years until God finally said, now is the time. And he rose up a deliverer by the name of Moses. And Moses delivered the people from slavery in Egypt. He led them out into the wilderness where God gave them a law, the law and God made a covenant with them. Really, another promise. He says, here are the rules. And if you follow and love me and love me alone, and you love the law and you meditate on it day and night, I'm going to give you this land that was promised to Abraham, and you are going to live in this land, and it is going to be wonderful. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, and you are going to be successful, and I'm going to give you victory over the people who live there now, and it is going to be your own, your own home sweet home. But you've got to trust me. and You've got to follow the law. Okay, so then they sent 12 spies into the land in order to kind of see what's there, and all 12 spies come back, and they have a report. They say, oh my goodness, it's huge walled cities, powerful um, defenses. The people there are so tall that we feel like grasshoppers in comparison to them. And ten, so they all 12 agree on those facts. Ten of them say, because that's true, we don't have any business going in there. We should just stay out. But there were two named Caleb and Joshua. And Caleb and Joshua had a different opinion. Yeah, they're tall. Yeah, their cities are well fortified. But they don't have God fighting for them. We do. They don't have God's promises on their side. We do. We're not the ones that are going to have to do the fighting. God is the one who's going to do the fighting through us. It's his promise. He's going to fulfill it. Let's go. But the people as a whole say, no, we're not doing it. And so God curses them because of their lack of faith to wander around in the desert for 40 years. So when we get to the beginning of Joshua, this is where we're at. The Israelites were supposed to be in their land, but because they didn't have any faith, they were cursed to wander in the wilderness until that generation died. Now, they are right on the edge of the Jordan River, staring across it into the promised land, the land that God had promised to their ancestor Abraham, the land that would soon be theirs. And so here's the question. Are they going to have faith now? Are they going to trust God now? Are they going to do things God's way? And if so, then they're going to have victory, and they're going to enjoy the land that God um, has given to them. So we have great promises here, and these promises are going to be um, fulfilled. All right, but this isn't going to be an easy process, right? And it's not. As we go throughout the next, especially the first part of the book of Joshua, um, we're going to see very clearly that this is not going to be an easy process. They're going to have to trust the Lord. They're going to have to obey the Lord. There's going to be some times when they fail. There's going to be some times where they make bad decisions, and we're going to have to deal with those as they come. But in general, what is going to happen is that God's promise is going to be once and for all fulfilled. So here's the central truth today. God keeps his promises. It may not be in the timetable that we think it should be in, but God keeps his promises. Therefore, when we follow his mission or his will, we can do it without fear. You know, if we're doing the things that God wants us to do, we don't need to be afraid of anything or anyone. And when we face the sufferings of this life, we know that God has promised us a new heaven and a new earth. God has told us that we're citizens of a heavenly kingdom. Whatever happens here on this earth, we don't need to fear because we know exactly where we're headed. We're headed to eternity with the Lord. All right. Okay, so we're starting a new book here, and so we need to deal with a few introductory questions to get situated. So first of all, let's do with the who, and then we'll deal with the when, and then we'll deal with the why. So who? All right, who was this book written to? Well, it was written to the Israelite people as a theological retelling of their history. Okay, so that's very important. So, you know, normally when we think of a history book, you know, we don't understand that there's a point of view behind that history book. But every history book has a point of view. And it's the same thing with uh, books of the Bible that are history books. They're told for a reason. And so a lot of times the narrative is going to be shaped around that reason. And the reason here is to show um, that this is the fulfillment of promise and that God is involved in doing exactly um, what he says he's going to do. So it was written to the Israelite people to kind of be a theological retelling of this story of God fulfilling his promise. So who is it written by? This is a little bit harder question. 
because it's anonymous. You, know, you can't look in here and say, well, Joshua, son of Nun, wrote this book you know, on such and such a date. I mean, we see that in a lot of New Testament letters, but we don't see that um, in very many Old Testament books. So all we have to go by is tradition, and tradition tells us that Joshua is the one who wrote it. So it's written by Joshua then, and it's written about Joshua. There are a couple of eyes in Joshua chapter 5 and Joshua chapter 6, which makes you think Joshua did write it, because he was writing about himself in the first person, at least those two times. We're also told in chapter 8 of Joshua and also in chapter 24 that Joshua was in the business of writing things down. Like an event would happen and he would write it down. So it kind of makes sense that maybe the book of Joshua was actually written by Joshua himself. There is a huge discussion and retelling of his death at the end of the book. That would have been hard for him to write, in my opinion, since he was already dead. All right. So probably what's likely to have happened is that Joshua, while he was living, did write down some of the events of his life and some of the details. And then an editor later on came through and kind of compiled all those into what we have as Joshua today. So taking some of the things that Joshua, some eyewitness reports that Joshua wrote himself and kind of putting it together into a framework. So Joshua, I think it has its origin in Joshua, but I don't know if the final product um, necessarily, we could say everything was written by Joshua. So Joshua has got an interesting name. His name means God saves or Yahweh saves. The Greek form of his name is Jesus. So Jesus and Joshua share a name. It's the same name. And it's fitting for both of them. You know, we see that God saves Israel by rescuing her from slavery and taking her into her promised land to her new home. And it's the same thing with us. God rescues us through the work of Jesus, bringing us to our true home into the kingdom of God. Yahweh saves, very fitting name for both Joshua and Jesus. So that leads us to our second question. Written to the people of Israel, had its origin in the person of Joshua. When was it written? Well, when it was written depends on the date of the Exodus. So the Exodus is when the Israelites came out or exodusted from Egypt. So when did that happen? So people tend to believe in one of two dates. So one's called the early date, one's called the late date. So the early date for the Exodus would be around 1440 BC, which would put the conquest at 1400, 40 years later. All right, the late date is 1260 BC for the Exodus, and that would have put the conquest then where we're at right now, about 1220 BC. So what clues do we have? Well, clue number one comes from 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, when we're talking about Solomon. And it said that Solomon's reign was 480 years after the Exodus. Okay? It doesn't actually say 480, but that's how it's interpreted. So if we're going to go 480 years before uh, Solomon, guess where we're going to get to? 1440. Now, <clears throat> what it does say in 1 Kings 6 is that there is going to be 12 generations, or there are 12 generations from the time of Exodus until the reign of King Solomon. And so normally people associate a generation with 40 years, so 12 times 40 equals 480, which takes you back to 1440. But the word generation doesn't have to mean 40. You know, it can be a more general term for a time period. Um, it also can be symbolic. In Jewish writings, a generation was often used as, as symbolic. The number 12 in Jewish writings is also a very symbolic number. So I don't think that the Bible says necessarily you have to put the Exodus date at 1440. So are there any other clues? Well, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 11 we learn that the Israelites built the city of Ramesses in, while they were in slavery in Egypt. So Pharaoh Ramses didn't even reign until 1290. So it makes, you have to kind of play some gymnastics um, in order to kind of explain that passage away. So a lot of times they'll say, well, they built a city that later became Ramses' city. Um, but probably the more natural way to, to read it is that they actually built the city at the order of Pharaoh Ramses. The, second clue, the third clue, then, is the political situation in Canaan. So if you go back to the 1400s, Egypt had pretty direct control over Canaan. And so it was pretty much a, a vassal of Egypt. Now, by the time you get to the 1200s, Egypt's power had waned. And so they didn't really have much say of what went on in Canaan anymore. And it was mostly run by city-states. And so when we see Joshua get to the land of Canaan, you don't see any Egyptian authority there at all. Basically, you just see these individual city-states. So if you look at, if you could line up everybody, you know, this scholarship has to offer and see what opinion they come early or late, 
about 75% of people are going to go with a late date, and 25% are going to go with an early date. But I don't think that the Bible requires either way, and I don't think a couple hundred years in the scheme of things is going to, it doesn't really affect how we understand the book at all. So when, I don't know, pick your poison. You want a late early date? Fine, you want a late date. But sometime between 1400 and uh, 1250 BC. So the final question is, why was it written? And that's easy. It was written to be a theological retelling of the conquest, you know, of Israel finally making their way home, of God finally fulfilling his promise that he made to Abraham. You know, he's going to continue to fill that, fulfill that promise later on. We'll talk about, more about that as kind of the book unfolds. But God promised Abraham land if he obeyed. He reiterated this promise to Isaac. He reiterated the promise to Jacob. He reiterated the promise through Moses and the law. And now is the time for that promise to be fulfilled. So we've got two parts to the book of Joshua. Okay, so the first part is what we're called conquest. And the second part we'll call the division. So in the first part of Joshua, they cross over the Jordan River and they take over the land. Okay, so it's going to be pretty bloody. There's going to be a lot of war. And we'll try to think theologically exa exactly what that meant then and what it means today. And then the second part, we're going to kind of go through pretty quickly because it's just uh, the division of the land. So there's, I think, like a six or seven chapter period there where literally it's just kind of giving you boundaries to different parts of the land. So we're not going to spend too much time there. But there's the conquest and then finally the division where each tribe gets their own allotment of land. So this is, uh, you can see the 12 tribes here. This is where they ended up. And I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple things that could be confusing. Okay, so if you're thinking about the 12 sons of Joseph, I mean, sorry, of Jacob, which end up being the 12 tribes of Israel, Levi doesn't get an apportionment of land, and instead Joseph gets a double portion. Okay, so that can be confusing to some people. So you can see up here Manasseh is actually a son of Joseph. He's not a son of Jacob. And Ephraim, below it, you can see Ephraim, is also a, a son of Joseph. So the two of them together end up being the house of Joseph. And if you see there, you know, Manasseh's territory, there's some of it on the west side of the Jordan, and there's some of it on the east side of the Jordan. Okay? Uh, on the east side of the Jordan is one of Manasseh's sons, Machir. And then on the west side of the Jordan is Manasseh's other son. All right? And so the rest of them are all, I mean, Asher, Naphtali, Zebulon, Issachar, uh, Gad, Reuben, Judah, Simeon, Dan, Benjamin. These are all sons of, um, of Jacob. Okay, so eventually, you know, as we get to the end of the book of Joshua, the land is going to be divided up like this. Each, uh, each tribe is going to be given their own allotment except for the tribe of Levi, and we'll talk a lot specifically about the tribe of Levi as well. All right, go to the next one. Is there another map? Okay, yeah. So here we're starting, you can see the starting point just over there in the plains of Moab. And uh, we're going to go across the Jordan River, and then we're going to have these campaigns here, one where we kind of take over Jericho and the cities in the central part, and then we're going to have a campaign where we take over the cities in the southern, and then we're going to finally end with a campaign where we take over the cities in the north. That's kind of the general um, plan going on there. And in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy, they've already taken over this land to the east side. So if you look at the last map, you saw that Gad was over there, um, uh, Reuben was over there, and then the half-tribe of Manasseh, Machir, was over on the east side. So by the time we start the book of Joshua, they already have their land. Okay, so it's only the people to the, the promised land proper there over on the west side. They're the ones that haven't got their land yet. All right, so let's talk about the story here. You know, the first part of chapter 1, you know, we really just have Joshua hearing from God. God is speaking to him and saying, this is what I want you to do. And he tells them that just like Moses was the leader of Israel, now it is your turn. So God is passing the mantle of leadership on from Moses to Joshua. So Joshua is replacing Moses as God's kind of main character here. So the Israelites have been wandering around the wilderness for 40 years because of their disobedience. They've had a lot of different battles on that side of the Jordan that they've won. And two and a half tribes have settled over there. All right. And so God makes a promise here to Joshua and to the people that just like he was with Moses, so he's going to be with them as they take over the land that God has promised. So what is the land that God has promised? This is very interesting here because we get the scope of it. You know, he says that to the south, it's going to be the Negev. So go back to that map here a second ago. All right. So the, you see Edom down there? Um, that would be the Negev Desert. Okay, Edom was in the Negev. 
we're told that's going to be the southern boundary. Uh, the western boundary is the Mediterranean Sea. So we can actually see those two boundaries. The northern boundary is going to be the mountains of Mount Hermon and that kind of area. And that's up all the way to the north. You see where Sidon is up to the top there? Um, that's where the northern boundary was. So we can see all three of those boundaries, north, west, and south. The east, though, goes all the way to the river Euphrates, which the Israelite people have never, ever in their history owned that much. Okay, so, I mean, to me, personally, as, you know, there's a big word out there called dispensationalist. You can look it up if you feel the need to. But we believe that there is a future for Israel, and uh, we believe that one day God will make the dimensions that as big as he promised. So we believe in something called a millennial kingdom where those promises are going to be um, literally fulfilled here. So God chooses Joshua here to lead the people to get the land. And there's two prongs to this. Not only are they going to fulfill the promise that God made to Abraham to get the land, but also they're going to be the hand of God's judgment against the people who do live there. Right? And so that's the reason God says that we had to wait 400 years. The reason that they had to wait 400 years is because of the sins of the Amorites was not yet full, meaning that they weren't ready for judgment. God was giving them more time to leave behind their idolatry and to turn to him, but they don't. And so we got to remember that. This is it also, as much as it's God fulfilling his promise to Abraham, it's also God judging the Amorites through the hand of the Israelites. And, and that's going to inform a lot of the things as we move forward here. So Joshua, God says to Joshua, I want you to go into this land. I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to follow the will of God. I don't want you to turn to the right from it. I don't want you to turn from the left of it. I want you to just follow me. I want you to do the mission that I have given to you. And if you do, you will have victory and you will find success and you guys will enjoy life in your new home and in your new land. So that's kind of the main idea, right? I mean, this is the mission that I have for you. These are the promises that I've made to you. And if you do what I tell you to do, you don't need to be afraid of anything or anyone because I'm the one that's going to do the fighting for you. I'm the one who's going to win the victory for you. All right, so he gets his marching orders from God here. And then the second part of chapter one is that he follows those marching orders to a T. So he calls together all of the elders. You know, he calls together all of his officers. He gets people organized. He goes throughout the camp and tells people to get supplies ready because in three days, they're going to head across the river and they're going to begin the conquest. They're going to finally take possession of the land that God had promised them 600 years before. But we have a slight issue that we deal with here at the end of Joshua chapter 1. And that is these two and a half tribes. They've already got their land. So if I'm Gad, if I'm Reuben, if I'm Makir, I'm sitting there saying, why do I have to go across the river to help you guys get your land? I'm pretty fine right here. Right? So that would be a temptation to just kind of say, hey, my part's over with. You guys go ahead and do you, um, but I'm going to stay over here. But that's not what God had said. God had said at the beginning that, yes, there were going to be some tribes that get land on the east side of the Jordan, but they still needed to send troops over um, to help everybody till everybody got their allotment of land. So there's kind of this sticking point here. Will these guys do that or not? And this isn't going to be the first time we see a sticking point between those on the east side and those on the west side. Throughout Israelite history, there become, there's becomes animosity between the two. This Jordan River becomes a pretty big dividing line. But right here at the beginning... They're on board. They're like, yeah, we promised we would send people. We're going to send our best. And if anybody, any one of them deserts, we'll, we'll kill them. Right? They have to fulfill what God has said. They have to go across the river, and we have to help you until every last tribe has their inheritance. So Joshua is commissioned to lead this great mission to take hold of the promised land, and he does just that. And he's perfectly qualified for that. So I have some qualifications up here that we see throughout Scripture. You know, that the leader of Israel should be somebody with a track record of success. And Joshua definitely was that kind of person. It was supposed to be somebody who was filled with faith. And, and we can look at the story in Numbers 14, where uh, Joshua is one of the two spies that comes back with faith. You know, someone who learned from Moses. You know, he was by Moses' side when he received the law. Every step of the way, Joshua was right there watching Moses and the decisions that he made. It should be someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're told in Numbers 27, 18 that Joshua was that kind of person, that he was filled with the Spirit of God. It was supposed to be someone who was known to obey. In Numbers 32, 12, there's a situation where it would have been very easy for Joshua to disobey, but we're told that he was an obedient person to God. And it should be somebody that was wise. 
In Deuteronomy 34, verse 9, Joshua is called wise. He's claimed to have wisdom. So Joshua ends up being the perfect person um, for this job, and he does make some mistakes, but in the end, he does a very good job. All right. Now we need to take another quick detour here, and we need to talk about how do you interpret the Old Testament? You know, we, we studied the book of Malachi a, a couple of months ago. Malachi and the prophets are a little bit different. There's a lot of things that can directly speak to us. But when we get back here to these kind of historical books, you know, there's going to be a lot of things that we need to do to interpret it correctly, how we are to apply it today. So back when I used to teach freshman um, Bible class um, at college there at Grace, we used to use this textbook, and I, and I think it had a good illustration. You know, it had um, two towns, and the two towns were separated by a river in the middle. Okay, the one town was called Our Town. This is where we live. You know, where do we live? We live in the Western Hemisphere, United States of America. When do we live? We live in the 21st century. What language do we speak? We speak English. On the other side of the river was the world of the Bible, depending on what book of the Bible you were writing to or studying from. Okay, they didn't speak English, no Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic. You know, they didn't live in the Western Hemisphere. They lived in the Eastern Hemisphere. They didn't live in the 21st century. They lived in the ancient world. And so all of this creates this river, this difference. And in order to really understand the Bible and what it says, we have to cross over into their culture and their time and their language as much as we are able, understand what it was meant then, pull the principles out, and then cross back over the river. How do those principles apply to us today? Okay. Now, those all apply to the New Testament and Old Testament alike. Time, place, language, culture. But there's one specific one just to the Old Testament, and that's covenant. You know, the people of Israel lived underneath the old covenant, the law of Moses. We don't live under the law of Moses. We live under the new covenant. And so because of that, we have to take one extra step. Not only do we have to account for time and place and culture and language, we also have to account for the change in covenant. So sometimes you'll hear me do that pretty blatantly. I'm going to do it here in a second, where we, uh, we say, okay, this is what it would have meant under the old covenant. What does it mean to us today? So let me give you an example. You know, since we're talking about the land, let's talk about the land. So God promised the people of Israel land. Did God promise you land? Answer, no. Okay. Did God make you a promise? Yes, he promised you a new kingdom a kingdom of God, a heavenly kingdom, a kingdom that was not built by human hands. So we do have a promise, but we got to remember that our promise is different than the promise that God made to Abraham. God promised him a literal piece of dirt. God did not promise us that. That's going to be a change. That's a difference that we're going to have to account for. You know, and God gave us a different mission. Did God say, I want you to take over a nation through violence? No, that is not the mission that he has given to you. It's not the mission that he's given to the church. And so that is the mission that he had given to Joshua at this point in history. And that's the case. You know, as we kind of go throughout the Bible, different people have different missions. God told Noah that he was supposed to build an ark. God told Gideon that he was supposed to fight the Midianites. God told Abraham he was supposed to leave Ur and go to the land of Canaan. God told Jonah that he was supposed to go preach um, to the Ninevites. And God told Joshua that he was supposed to take the land. But these were specific missions to specific people at specific times. So when we're talking about the mission that God gave to Joshua and the promises that God gave to Joshua, we can't just assume that that mission and promises are for us too. We have to cross the river and say, okay, in our part of the God story, in our part of the covenant, what's the mission that he's given to me? And what is the promises that he has made to me? And they're different. You know, our mission was given to us by Jesus, you know, right before his ascension. He says, we're to go into all nations and make disciples by baptizing people in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey the Lord. <clears throat> Taking the good news to the ends of the earth. That's our mission. How do we do that? We do that by living out the character of Jesus. We do that by sharing the gospel with the people that we meet in our life. And it's on that mission that we are promised that we don't have to be afraid. So we can look and meditate on the word of God just like they did. But we have to remember what our mission is. We have to remember why God has placed us where he has. And that's where we have no fear. That's where we can have courage to do whatever we want because we know that the Lord has said, this is where we are headed. Our blessings are also going to be different. So, you know, our uh, promises are different, our mission is different, and the blessings that are attached to it are also different. So if you go back uh, to the old covenant, the old covenant was set up as, if you follow God and you do what he says, you are going to be blessed physically. 
That means you're going to win victory in battle. That means you're going to have health. That means you're going to have long life. That means you're going to have lots of money and wealth. And, but as soon as you start to disobey and follow after idols, that's when you are going to lose. And that's when you are going to experience poverty. And that's when you're going to experience sickness. And maybe if it keeps going, I'm going to pull you out of the land, which ends up happening, of course. Right? So we're not set up that way. Where if we follow God, then we're going to get big mansions and fancy cars and awesome jobs. And that's not how our part is set up. We, our blessings are spiritual blessings. We get love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, we're blessed uh, with joy. And we're blessed with a future in the kingdom of God where there is no more sickness or suffering or death. So we have to account for these things as we interpret any of the chapters of Joshua. We have to account for the different promises, the different mission, and the different blessings. All right, so let's look specifically here at chapter 1 as we close up. What can we learn here specifically um, from Joshua receiving this mission and starting this mission? Well, the first thing I think is we should understand that we too are on a mission, and we need to be fulfilling that. Just like Joshua was supposed to fulfill the mission that he gave, God gave to him, we should be fulfilling the mission that God has given to us. Just like Joshua was willing to gather together his troops, cross the river, and start into battle, we should be willing to take the gospel um, to the ends of the earth, to live out the selfless values of our King Jesus. All right, so graduation speeches. So I'm going to help two people out in the room here, because I think that we have a good shot of having two future valedictorians sitting here. I think Kate, maybe next year, and then Jada, maybe the year after that. We'll see. Right? But here, here's, if you've got to do a, a valedictorian speech, I'll tell you how to rock it. Okay? You can teach on one of, you can speak on one of these three issues, and you'll knock it out of the park. Preferably, might as well do all three. All right? So first one, just tell people they're amazing. Just look at all these graduates and say, you've worked so hard. You've come so far. Your parents said you could never do it. Here you sit and you're getting this diploma. You're such great people. You've got such a bright future ahead of you because you've, uh, you've shown that you've had stick to Okay, topic number one, people will love it. All right, topic number two, follow your dreams. You've got dreams. I know you can be whatever you want to be. If you can think it, you can do it. You know, if you want to be a doctor, go be a doctor. And if you want to go to the moon, go to the moon. And, you know, if you want to be president of the United States, good luck. That's an awful job. <laughs> but you can do it because you can follow your dreams. Okay, topic number three. Don't ever give up. There's going to be people in your road all the time. Everywhere you go, someone's going to try to stop you. There's going to be that bad teacher. You know, there's going to be the, maybe one of your parents. You know, maybe a sibling or maybe a boss or somebody's going to be in your way. Don't let them stop you. You realize your dreams. You can do it. Never give up. Okay, preferably just all three. Just start with, hey, you're amazing. Hey, you have great dreams. Follow those dreams. Anybody stand in your way, back them down. All right. Okay, there you go. You can rock the uh, graduation speech. All right, so here's the part where Aaron gets less inspirational. All right, <laughs> the truth of the matter is, is that uh, real life doesn't always live up to the graduation speech. You can't always be everything that you want to be. You most likely are not the last best hope for planet Earth. I don't suggest that one. <laughs> you are not the last best hope for planet Earth. Maybe you shouldn't follow your dreams. Maybe your dreams are stupid. <clears throat> and probably, ultimately, you shouldn't expect life's most meaningful gifts to come through unchecked self-expression. That's not where life's most meaningful gifts come from. Where they come from is by following and participating in the mission that God has for us. And there's a general mission that we've talked about to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But there's also a specific mission that God has given to you. God has gifted you specifically in a different way than he's gifted me. And that's by design. Because it's when we work together that we're going to fulfill the mission of God. And that's when we're going to find ultimate satisfaction in life. Is not when we're doing whatever we want, no matter what it costs or no matter who it hurts. But when we're doing the things that God, want us to do, God wants us to do, we're, we're living out his values and following in the footsteps of Christ. Where we're giving of ourselves, showing the gospel by how we live and sharing it by what we say. So the cardinal virtues of a graduation speech are self-will and don't let anybody stand in your way to success. You know, the values of the mission of God are trusting in the Lord, persevering in the faith, and sacrificing ourselves for the sake of others. Joshua's mission, conquer a piece of land east of the, or west of the Jordan River. And God was going to do that with him, for him. 
and fulfillment of the promises that he made to Abraham. Therefore, he didn't need to be afraid of whatever came his way. He could move forward with boldness and encouragement. Our mission is different. It's to share and show the gospel. And God will do it through us as well, if we are dependent on him and if we trust in him, if we're faithful to his word. And so in fulfillment of his promises made to us through the new covenant, we also don't need to be afraid and we can move forward with courage and boldness in our faith because we know that the Lord will be there right with us. All right, second, we should fulfill the mission that God has given us together. We do it together. This is not something that you need to do on your own. We have each other to rely on. You know, I uh, candidated at a church in Michigan way long time ago, and I didn't get, a, <laughs> I didn't get the job. But it was interesting. They, normally what a church does is that they'll spend a year trying to find the right person, and then they'll put that person up in front of the church, and then they'll say yes or no. It's usually how it works in our kinds of circles. This church was different. They found three people that they liked. They put all three of them up in three successive weeks, and then they had the church vote on which one that they wanted. And so, you know, I went up there and candidated. Two other guys went up there and candidated, and I didn't end up making the cut. So I was interested. I was interested. You know, what, what did this guy say that got him hired? And so they had the tape online, and so I, I listened um, to his sermon. And the sermon was titled, Real Christians Never Retire. And so it was a pretty interesting sermon because this church was a snowbird church. So it was up in northern Michigan. And they said the church is about 80 or 90 people in the summer. In the winter, it goes down to six because everybody goes to Florida. So you can imagine what the average age of that church was. Pretty, pretty high. And so, yeah, that's a pretty good message. Real Christians never retire. Because I've heard people say, oh, you know, I've been teaching Sunday school for 40 years. It's time for the young whippersnappers to do it. And yes, Younger people, they need to take up the mantle of leadership, and we need to help train them and prepare them um, to be the next generation. We don't want to hold on to everything, and then once it's time to turn it over, it's too late. But at the same time, real Christians don't ever retire. I think we learned that from Gad, from Reuben, and from Makir. They could have retired and said, hey, you know, we've got our part, we've done our thing, you guys go over to the other side of the river, you do your thing. But that isn't what happened, is it? They went and they helped till every single land was conquered. They helped everybody till everybody got their allotment of land. And it's the same thing in the kingdom of God. We are in this together, all of us, and there's no retirement. There might be a change of role. Um, there might be a change in what we do, but we are always supposed to be serving um, the Lord and doing it together. Third, we can do this without fear. We can do this without fear. Just like Joshua could do it without fear because God was with him, we too can do it without fear because God is with us. You know, I think Desmond Tutu is a great example of this boldness. So if you've never heard of him, he was a pastor in South Africa who stood up against apartheid, you know, the separation of the races um, in South Africa. You know, he began to preach in his church that all citizens should be treated the same no matter what color their skin is. And because of this teaching, he, was, he started to be targeted by the government. They tried to shut him down at every corner and every turn. During one of the deepest and darkest days of apartheid, he decided that he was going to hold a rally in the capital, in Cape Town, South Africa. Huge rally. Got the, all the permits around and, and had everything ready to go. At the last minute, the government came in and shut him down and saying, we don't want you to speak. We don't want this rally to go on. So a local church there, St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town, decided instead, well, they'll just invite him over that evening and they'll have a church service where he speaks back. So he was speaking at this church, and hundreds and hundreds of people um, started to congregate in the church. When the government saw how many people were attending this church service, they decided to send in the police. So they sent in 150 police officers into the church building, and they stood all around the sanctuary. They also had given every one of those police officers a notebook and a pen. And so they were standing there on the side of the church, and they had their notebook and pen, and they were supposed to write down everything that Desmond Tutu said because they were going to use it against him in the future. But that'd be pretty intimidating. You know, I'm intimidated by just you guys most Sundays. I can't imagine if police, armed police are like standing around taking notes of everything I say. But he wasn't to be intimidated. And he declared that apartheid is evil. He, played, he said that apartheid could not endure, that God himself opposed it. And eventually, at the end of the sermon, he looked directly at the police officers and addressed them. And he says, yes, you are powerful. You are extremely powerful. But you are not gods. And I serve a God who will not be mocked and is far more powerful than you. 
So since you've already lost, I invite you today to join the winning side. And with that, the entire congregation that was there just jumped up and just started singing and dancing at the top of their lungs. And the police had no idea what to do. And it was one of the events that started the beginning of the downfall of apartheid. Courage, boldness, and that's what we're called to. I mean, if we're doing the things that God wants us to do, and we're doing them the way that God wants us to do them, we don't need to be afraid of anyone or anything, because we're on God's mission. We're following after his promises, and we're going to expect his blessings. God's kingdom will come. Our job is just to make sure as many people are in it as possibly can be in it. So we should live out the love of the Lord, and we should share his message with the world with boldness and courage and without fear. Why? Because God is with us. God is with us. Just like he said to Joshua, I'm going to be with you on the mission that I've given to you. He says the same thing to you and I. I'm going to be with you on the mission I've given to you. So we need to trust him that God will never leave us or forsake us. So I just want to end by one passage of scripture here from John 14. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives in you and, is, and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live in you, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and that my Father is in me, and that you are in me, and that I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Jesus is trying to say the exact same thing as we see in Joshua. That He has a mission for us. He doesn't leave us on our own. He sends us an advocate to help with that mission. We don't need to be afraid. We can do exactly what God wants us to because he's the one that's going to give us the power to do it and bless us when we do. Let's pray. Dear Lord, again, as we kind of embark on a journey through Joshua, which can often be very difficult to figure out how it applies to our life, Lord, we just pray that you give us as much insight as we possibly can have um, to see how this applies to us today. Lord, we just want to pray specifically for this message from Joshua 1, that we, don't be, that we don't fear, that we're not afraid. Instead, that we boldly move um, and live for you in the world right where you've placed us. We pray that that's true of every single one of us. In your name, amen.